I found it quite interesting, even humorous last night, Shannon, to watch the coverage of game four of the Stanley Cup final and see Montreal Canadiens fans rejoicing in the street as if they just won the Stanley Cup, not in all likelihood delayed the inevitable, um, which would, would be a loss in the Stanley Cup final. Um, could you care to try and explain this to me? Uh, I, I, I guess I would just categorize it as little victories. You know, uh, there, there, there has to be small steps. You know, this is a team that uh, has been down three to one before the, in this, in this playoff and come back to win. And uh, uh, this team has overachieved since the playoffs started, what was it, in, in the North Division on May the 10th? They've overachieved. So in order to win four games, you had to win the first one. So I think that that's what, I think that's what Montrealers were, uh, were, in, were having a good time. Well, they were having a good time, period. But having a good time with the, with the victory, with, with the way Josh Anderson scored the goal, uh, with the fact that this was by far their best game of the final. Uh, so I, I, I just think that there was a, a natural release by a group of people that are, have been satisfied since, uh, since the playoffs started. It just seemed to be me to be an overreaction. I mean, I, of course you're happy. I think any fan of a team would be happy if you win a game. Um, but very quickly you would realize, okay, now we're down three to one and we still have a long way to go. Mm-hmm. And I got the sense that the reaction was as if, if they'd won the Stanley Cup. And um, Well, perhaps was, this is as close as they're going to get. It, it, uh, it might very well. Yeah. Uh, did you see anything last night that uh, would suggest that um, this team is capable of coming back? Well, um, you know, Carey Price was, was back at a, a place um, that uh, we've seen a lot in these four rounds. Uh, I think the the changes that the team made on the blue line, particularly with uh, Romanov and Kulak, made a ton of sense. Uh, both of them um, contributed, uh, um, both offensively and defensively. Uh, I, I wasn't sold on uh, on the on the KK move, but by by juggling the lines a little bit, Josh Anderson, who hadn't hadn't played very well and hadn't scored was a factor last night. So the coach can sit there and say, Hey, we, we juggled something and and that was okay. Uh, I think they still have to find a way to wake Tyler to up uh, for the rest of the series in order to try to compete. So I, I, I think that there was a few things I, I don't, you know, remember. Um, and and it, it depends on what series we look at, but we, we tend to make, big things out of last changes and some sometimes little things out of last changes. Let's remember that Tampa is going home and John Cooper now has the last change, uh, which will mean he can, he can get, uh, you know, the right matchups for, for Braden point. He can get the right matchup for uh, Anthony Sorelli. So I, I think that that's a factor. I think that will come to uh, come to be a, a, a bigger part of game five on Wednesday. Uh, one of the things that I noticed um, I think everybody noticed is Montreal or, uh, Tampa had the opportunity had a um, at a power play yeah at the end of regulation a four minute power play and were unable to really generate I don't know did they get a a, a scoring chance out of that power play maybe one maybe one maybe one but it wasn't a great scoring chance I don't think they one went and didn't one go off the goalpost I think one went off the goalpost so well that. As so often happens, you miss a scoring opportunity, um, and especially in overtime, and the other team c- comes right down the ice because the goal was scored not long That's right. after the penalty ended. Mm-hmm. And we see that so often in the game. It's really quite extraordinary. That, that, that was, it, it, that all, and all of those skirmishes late um, and after whistles to me were, were fascinating. This was one that I... I think Montreal dodged that real bullet because they were they were in no position to be that antagonistic about things. They weren't. Um, but at the same time, I guess they had, you know, and we've seen it through the whole playoffs, how much confidence they have in their penalty killing and how strong they've been to 
to uh, to kill those situations. But uh, to sit there and see Shea Weber in the penalty box as long as he was uh, had to create some angst for everybody. And then, as you said, uh, the the opportunity for Tampa, and then not just m- not much after that, Anderson burst down the left side and scores. We'll talk a bit more about um, the Stanley Cup final. The NBA final commences uh, tonight on Tuesday evening. And a little baseball talk. I want to chat a little bit about franchises who underachieve and franchises who historically overachieve. And can we analyze exactly why this happens? Is there something that we don't talk enough about? Uh, We'll address all that, and Keith Oberman will uh, join us when uh, we continue after these messages. And we are back. It's uh, McCowan. It's Shannon. Mm -hmm. And we are joined by our friend uh, Keith Oberman. Uh, From a safe environment now, I I understand. The city of New York is uh, close to um, immune from any problems, any COVID problems. Yeah. What are you talking about? They still have Jim Dolan? That's (laughs) what Yeah, thanks for getting me started on that before I even say hello, John. Yes, we still we still have that viral epidemic that's been raging here for the entirety of the 21st century. Now that he's extended himself to burning down a, a hockey team, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more fun than ever. But uh, in terms of overall health, yeah, I mean, it really is. It's, it's now a surprise to see somebody wearing a mask out of doors. I would say on the streets in the last week, it's, it's particularly, it's, Six percent, six percent out of out of people. Very few. And I have uh, the the best restaurant in New York has reopened after two years. They had been closed because of a building uh, destruction, and they've reopened near me, within steps from my front door. And they are. Uh, I have eaten there inside, no mask, nobody wearing a mask, no fear of it. Uh, Ten times out of the last twelve nights, so. I'll be 500 pounds by Christmas, but we'll be healthy otherwise. <laughs> uh, variety is the spice of life, except if you're Keith Oberman, I suppose, huh? Well, maybe the menu's big. Maybe the I, menu's big, big and varied, you know? There's an entire menu, and I have like six favorite dishes. So, you know, do you oh, really okay. have to? Do you have to have something different every night for two weeks? I mean, I don't think so. Well, well I, I don't know. Give- I, at my house, I go from a Big Mac to a quarter pounder to a McChicken, and you know, that's three three days and three different meals, right? Yes. Well, this is a this is a uh, butternut <laughs> squash ravioli <laughs> in a sage butter sauce, Uh-oh. and when you have one, you go, uh, "Let's see for dessert, how would it look if I ordered the same thing?" <laughs> yeah. and, and then the guy goes, "Well, you know, in the old place opposite the jazz center, we used to have a jazz performer who'd order it three servings at a time, no. and then get a and then get a fourth to go," and I was like. Well, the fourth to go is excessive, but I can see the rest of it. So, yeah, yeah. It's- so, Oberman, this is not like um, some coffee houses where you get a card and if you get it stamped ten times, you get a free meal or anything. That's not what we're talking about, is it? No, but you know, it's it's close enough that they have. There are occasionally, and there have been historically in the restaurants in the in the area. There are a lot of them. There's a discount for for residents of the you know sort of a small group of buildings that are connected and and. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I started the owner is an old friend of mine because I frequented his old place, although it was blocks away from my, where I lived and often quite a commute from where I lived, depending on where I lived. And it's, you know, he's talking about giving a, a 20% discount. And I'm going, well, let's up that 500 to Halloween, uh, 500 pounds at Halloween. If you're going to have a discount of 20%, I could go there and see three meals a day. And then it's, yeah. <laughs> next night you're going to see is me like this. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Hi, John. Yeah. Yeah, so one health problem gets replaced by another. That's the story of uh, uh So before you came on, John and I were chatting about the uh, Stanley Cup final, and um, it, it just appears to be an inevitability that this Tampa team is going to wind up winning this thing. Well, um, one would think so, unless you're the, what, the 42 Red Wings, uh, right? And then that's, well, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's yeah. It. I mean, if, I, I, didn't, I didn't see uh, either of Montreal's head coaches uh, throw a punch and get suspended for a couple of games, uh, throw a punch at a referee and then come back. So I don't know that the, that, that brilliant burst of energy is going to hit them, although they played okay last night. 
Um, I, I don't, I don't root for either of these teams. I tend not to root for any team, but I found myself, or I find myself in these kinds of situations. I'm intrigued by how you guys react late in the game. You know, it's two, two and Montreal gets that, that penalty with a minute or so left. And um, it's a double minor. So even if they go into overtime, it's going to be two and a half, three minutes of uh, uh, power play. And I actually was rooting for Tampa. And the reason I was rooting for Tampa was I love dynasties. I've said many times before dynasties, the older you get, as you think back over the dozens, even hundreds of seasons that the three of us have watched covered, what do you remember? Well, you remember greatness. You remember great individuals and you remember great teams and dynasties. You don't remember the one-offs, you know, I mean, there's the odd event that comes here and there, but that's the thing that sticks with you your entire life. And this Tampa team is really kind of close to being a dynastic team. Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I do. I just, uh, I, I don't know what my aversion is to them. I know a lot of people think fondly of the coach. I, I, I always thought that his press conferences were, uh, less than sportsmanlike. I think that may be a polite way to phrase it. And it's, it, there's something inherently, something doesn't sit right with me mm. that, that, that the hockey, the hockey center of the United States is in one of the last places I would still willingly associate with hockey in a community that is not particularly interesting. And uh, for all of the, of the greatness of that team, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, well, I don't like them, therefore they're no good. But I, I, I have a hard time coming up with, with, with a rooting interest for any one of the players on that team. And you know, it's, it's, it used to for a while was known as the as the Tampa Bay X Rangers. So I had a, I had mm -hmm. a rooting interest for a while. And I just, I, I can't get excited about them, and I don't know why mm -hmm. that is. And I'm also, I, I think this is true. Uh, I, I can't possibly speak for hockey fans in the United States as a whole. We are not one entity. But I. I really, I would think that most of them outside, and this speaks to the NHL's regionalization within the States, uh, I think most people watching, if asked, in the United States, if asked, who do you want to see win, would have been the Canadians. Um, I think that's a much more popular franchise. I think, and, and this is sometimes hard to convey, but I think the, you know, the, the Canadian franchises, particularly Montreal and Toronto, have been, are much more popular than your run-of-the-mill you know, sort of nouveau last 35 years American franchise. So it, I, it, I, agree with, I agree with your point, but I just don't, I, I, I just, I, I'm, I, I'm cold and out hope for the Canadians just on a, on a hockey story. No, fair enough. No. It's, it, it, so what, what, you know, when you look at the TV ratings, uh, if, you know, the, the NBA uh, semifinals, they're, they're threefold larger than hockey right now, at least uh, even, and, and and Phoenix is the, is a, 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 a you know a top fifteen market. Milwaukee certainly isn't. Atlanta is, um, but where where do you where do you put the following of hockey in your country right now? Well, it, you know when when I was doing the, the night I did the highlights on on ESPN of my childhood team winning the Stanley Cup in 1994, right. the, the you know the play by play broadcast. Uh, we did our play-by-play -play broadcast did not have my first boss Sam Rosen, but he was he finished it, he finished his our boys finished ours, and then I came on the Sports Center and did the three-minute highlight package. Um, the night that happened, I think it was pretty clear it was football, baseball, NBA, and right behind the NBA was the NHL, and there was a lot of hope among those of us who have found hockey to be a fairly more sophisticated game than baseball with far more interesting people and far more interesting teams. There was a hope that the, that, that, that leap forward would be, would be advanced, particularly by the coming expansions to the Sun Belt and, you know, the new teams in, in Southern California and in Florida and, you know, wherever by then we knew the Hartford Whalers would eventually move. It's like, well, they're going to Nashville. They have a deal they can go to Nashville with. Um, uh, we thought that was the beginning of it because that's 25 you know, years ago though. No, I understand that, but I think that's the answer. The answer to the question starts, starts 25 years ago. Um, actually, you know, 27 years ago. 
Rangers win the Stanley Cup, and what happens immediately when, when New York, Manhattan, as opposed to Long Island, gets a Stanley Cup and all the advertising uh, companies are like, well, now it's time to put a little money into hockey. We have a, you know, a New York team. We can get free tickets out of it if we buy the spots on the broadcast. Well, what happens? There's no season right. in the following year. And I, Joe, I always thought that was a missed opportunity and the road not taken, and who knows what would have happened then. But I think over the, that, that period of time, since the Rangers paraded the cup down Broadway, I think hockey has settled into a kind of permanent fourth. And uh, there's no hope of reaching the number three sport, which is, I'm sad to say, baseball, and the number two sport, which is clearly basketball. And I'm not even factoring in the college sports because it's college sports is such a regional thing that, you, you know, as big as it is in some parts of the country, it's meaningless. There's no college basketball or football in the northeast essentially so that's that area is gone but you know the 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 thing about all sports in the united states has been and it's been true gradually it's been growing and growing and now we're sort of seeing it accelerate the sports that managed to make some of their teams at least national entities identifiable with fan bases everywhere in the country are the sports in which the postseason sells and draws audiences and those sports that have failed to do that or have cut back on their national footprint, uh, like baseball, have seen their, their ratings decline. And the NHL is kind of in the middle. But, I mean, what, who, who is a, you know, you, you could very easily identify uh, one and one A in terms of national teams in Canada. I mean, obviously, you're going to rank seven of them. You're going to come up with a one and a seven. But one and one A are miles different from, from, from the rest of them. Mm -hmm. and you are, who, are the, who, are the, who are the national teams? What hockey fan would make sure he's going to watch the Stanley Cup final with or without his team being present in it? And that's a huge problem for the NHL. And baseball is discovering that's, that's, what's, that's what's killing baseball's ratings because nobody cares about the World Series anymore, which used to be the World Series. Everything stops. And mm -hmm. now it's, who's playing? I don't like either of those teams. I'm going to watch a rerun of Bewitched. <laughs> Well, how much of this, though, guys, is... She's pretty good. She was quite pretty, though, Elizabeth Montgomery. Lovely, you know, woman, admit. lovely woman and a friend of mine and a yeah. great storyteller. She was tremendous. She was a big sports fan, too. Um, a lot of this is relative to the star syndrome and the ability to draw fans, I, I've always perceived, in a postseason where you don't really have, in most cases, don't have a rooting interest in either team, mm -hmm. is who's that great player that I haven't seen very much of and now I'm going to get to see them multiple times. In the absence of that, where do you go? And has the NBA done the best job of creating stars, creating attractions that have some kind of storyline before the final series begins? But the, the sport is more con that sport is more conducive to creating stars. Well, you okay, know when, when when LeBron can play forty four minutes. I mean, if we if Sidney Crosby played forty four minutes a night in a sixty minute game, he'd be a star. He'd be a bigger star. But it's not it's not physically possible. It's well, not physically possible. And, and there's the other element to it, which is it, you know one star can in fact a sport make in this country, and and I think. You know, we, we, we had epic periods of time in, in the NBA that preceded Michael Jordan. We had we had Larry Bird and we had Magic Johnson at perhaps their, you know, at, at least their, their relative to age, their athletic um, top points of their career. And yet it required a Michael Jordan to come in and, and people then began to see that as Michael Jordan and the NBA. But the other part of it is since then, as you know, those sort of rare matchups that you're talking about, Bob, is like, okay, like the World Series used to be. You know, mm -hmm. I've, never, I've never seen Willie Mays play against Mickey Mantle, mm -hmm. it, it had, except in the All-Star game, then it doesn't really mean anything, and here's it means everything. Well, that's all gone because of interleague play. You've seen everybody play everybody else. The All-Star game has no meaning in baseball. But the other part of it, about that, your, your point about the NBA that's so good, is that the second half of it is that the NBA is the, the game and the number of players on the court and the number of players in the teams are so small that it's not just, I want to see LeBron James. It's I want to see this new combination in which LeBron James plays alongside this player 
And then these two guys get to be teammates and, uh, and they're going to face, maybe they'll face each other in the finals, if not. And your six leading contenders have two guys who you may have not seen play together before. And you certainly have never seen two guys playing against those particular two guys they're playing in uh, playing against in the, in the, in the finals or anywhere in, along the lines. And I think that's as, as much as that sort of sucked out of the regular season and the idea of continuity from, from year to year, it's, it's exciting because you were seeing stars in new contexts and there's, that doesn't happen in other sports. Football no. is, I mean, football does periodically show us that as, as Brady going to the Buccaneers did. And that provided a level of excitement just when you might go, you know, I've been seeing Tom Brady in the Super Bowl since I was a child. I don't really need to see it yeah. again. But now it's interesting because he has a new cast. And it's, it, 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 you really do begin to think about what the psychological dynamics are of, of entertainment and new components to it and, and sports as entertainment and one's willingness to watch a, 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 a playoff series that one is not personally invested in. Yeah, yeah, just one other one other thing about what you were talking about, Keith, and and, and this is where the regional nature of hockey, and a, a, and a conscious decision by teams, really uh, comes back to roost. So we we have a Tampa Montreal Stanley Cup final. Um, Carolina was eliminated. For all intents and purposes, the Carolina Hurricanes told their hockey fans when that series ended, hockey's over. And, and I, when I worked at the league in New York, we used to have these arguments with the clubs. Could you please continue to help promote the game? Could you please continue to help discuss the Stanley Cup playoffs? I mean, it, it, you are a franchise amongst 30, 31, at the, you know, at, but will you please be part of helping us make our Stanley Cup final a national event? It's, and it, I mean, I remember sitting with at a board of governors meeting and, and somebody brought up, why would we, why would we ever consider taking as a franchise, if our franchise, let's say it was a McDonald's and it was not, uh, it was, you know, it was closed for the day for cleaning. Would we tell them, by the way, don't go to another McDonald's restaurant. And, and people would say, well, that's a good idea. You know, that's a really good point. And then nobody did anything. And nobody has done anything. And there's no continuity of believing in the sport beyond your own region. And, that, and that's because it, it's built on such regional rivalries. There's no way the Chicago Blackhawks are going to promote the St. Louis Blues because they hate each other. But, but look, I mean, in, it, I'll go back to the World Series for a second. When I first became a baseball fan, it was evident that, you know, you rooted for your team and you wanted to see them win the pennant and, and win the World Series. And if that failed, you wanted to see them win as many games as possible. And if that wasn't particularly likely, you wanted to see them beat their own rivals and finish not in fifth place, but in fourth place. You wanted to see all that. And then when the World Series started, because it was such an immediacy, end of the season, whatever the good pennant race was, then into the World Series, you rooted for your league. Right. And, and baseball mm -hmm. has destroyed that, and they never saw it coming. And some of us warned them that they were going to lose that uniqueness of of the unique matchup. And again, also uh, you sort of joined the bandwagon of, or possibly against the league in which your favorite team played. And, and we can't recreate that now in, even in the minds of people who didn't experience it. I was thinking about this the other day when I was a sportscaster in Boston in 1984. So it's not, you know, we were already in color. It was 1984. And if we were 20 seconds long, we used to prioritize the pages of national league scores. And if we were 20 seconds that had to be cut out of that show, the second, the first things that went were pages two and three of the National League scoreboards. Mm -hmm. Because it was an American League town and people wanted to see how right. the other American League teams did. And then it's like, okay, the Tigers in the World Series against who? San Diego? Screw San Diego. We're American League fans. Or if you if it were the Yankees, it's like, well, we're going to root for the Dodgers against the Yankees, obviously, right. whoever they're playing. And there's none of that anymore. And, and I'm not sure how you link that yeah, but I think the obvious way, perhaps, is to is to draw on for those those disaffected Canes fans. It's like, look, which which of these teams do you hate more? Like, make sure you root against them. You got to support them, and and even that you're authorized to wear the gear. I don't know. Offer people T-shirts that have half a Canes logo on it and half, you know, Montreal or or uh, or or Tampa Bay. What I mean, 
but 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 clearly something could be done and as usual sure. nothing is done nothing so, well nothing one of one of the things that has happened here and let us talk baseball for a se- second we, we speak we can now watch every game if you want to you have access to every game that's being played in every sport every night we did not grow up in that era you keith alluded to um uh well, I can't recall exactly what the what 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 it was, but but we had the opportunity. We did not have the opportunity to watch the stars on no, a regular no. basis. May, Mays versus Mantle, you never saw. Well, and I I got to see Willie Mays play maybe once a year, maybe twice. Um, you know, Sandy Koufax with the Dodgers, the West, the the National League West Coast teams. Games were only on on Saturday afternoon. Right. That was it. We now have the opportunity to watch all these games all the time. Back in our era, and you alluded to the fact that when the World Series came up, there's an explosion of interest because suddenly, not only do we get to see stars, we get to see games on a regular basis, and we get to see teams that we never got a chance to see. We don't have that anymore. We can see these guys anytime we want. You want to watch, um, you know, well, when Gretzky was playing, if you wanted to watch Gretzky play, even then, you could watch him almost every night. Now you can watch a star play every night. Yeah. And and interleague play, as you also alluded to, has defeated the purpose again. I you know maybe baseball ought to look at getting rid of interleague play. I know it's been discussed, but does it matter as much as it used to? Which interleague play or the well, World does it matter no, now? It's the reason why I mean I I have found myself in a unique position in 1995 when they were about to adopt interleague play. When USA Today still had its weekly baseball publication, they asked me to write a piece because I had been vocal on ESPN opposed to interleague play. And they asked me to write a piece, and it was a satirical one about sitting together at a at a, a Milwaukee, I guess it was a Milwaukee Brewers Cincinnati Reds game that nobody was interested in, and uh, what your final score thirty five to one or whatever because of the imbalance in the leagues and the question of what it did to the record books, and then talking about the World Series being two teams that you just saw play the last week of the regular season as all mm-hmm. if these were farcical things. What I did not know is that they were going to publish this alongside the, as the pro I was the con and the pro was the statement read by Bud Selig, the commissioner of baseball announcing interleague play. So that's my sort of jousting with Bud began when it suddenly looked like I was the ah. spoke for everybody who disagreed with Bud, which I was happy to be, but it was a little surprising. But my point being that that I think some of us saw that if you made the World Series simply, as Bob Costas famously put it, the MLB finals, you were going to lose a lot. And they were already losing something for the reasons that you mentioned. The they used to call the uh, the charm of distance, which is which is eliminated by by the ability to travel anywhere. Well, we don't have any charm of distance or uniqueness. And, and people used to really buy into that. And, you know, when. In the early 80s, a Gretzky team would play an Eastern team. It was often, you know, the only time you'd see it. And of course, the of course. video and, and, and live access to every game is, is the price you actually pay for that is that the playoffs begin to lose their, their uniqueness. But then you ask, how does football get away with it every year? Because it's not just the Super Bowl party that draws people to watching the Super Bowl game, although that's a huge thing. You could have a 100 to nothing game. And yes, the ratings would be bad and would still be probably the most watched event in world television, or at least North American television for that year. It's the other playoff games that people get excited about. And I think there's something to simple volume. You know, there are only now, what, 17 regular season games or 17, you know, 17 regular weeks of, of the season and the playoffs. And it's a very limited, you know, very limited number of, of impressions, as the mm-hmm. TV people say. And we don't have that in, in, in any sport that plays anything longer than a 17 game schedule. And, you know, it's like I don't know where the future is in terms of, of, of the value of postseason. But but all the sports that don't have the benefit of limited interaction during the regular season are going to have to figure something out or you're going to get a lackluster kind of thing where it's just uh, the only way the television networks will be able to afford it and, and invest in it and give the, the leagues the money that they want is if they get a you know new york los angeles meetup every time i mean every 
my my friend Stu Sternberg owns the the Tampa Bay Rays, and uh, I don't know how long he's um, dreamed about moving to to Montreal and Bowler and Park. And I you know it's it's a, it's a matter of legal dispute in in the Tampa area over when right. he began to actually look into it and when it was just sort of like an idea and. Uh, so I, I don't want to get into any depth there that re- ends up with me being subpoenaed. But the, the, the main argument against it was always this. It's like, well, what would happen now that, that, that now that it's impossible because there's just Toronto? What would happen if you had Toronto and Montreal in baseball in opposing leagues and they wound up somehow in the World Series or even if they're in the same league and they wind up in the American League Championship Series? What do you do then for American television rights? Neither of those cities' audiences will count. And nope. that's, all, that's all it is now. And it's really mm-hmm. that we've lost something in the finals. Again, the NBA has that, uh, that ability to show you a new shuffle. Uh, you, know, you, you, you literally are dealing, at, dealing the deck differently than you were last year in its old faces and new places every year. So they figured that out. They also did something a couple of years ago that I, I, I looked at and I went, this has deep meaning and I don't think anybody notices it. When they started to promulgate the, the standings and it no longer said, you know, Atlanta or New York, it just listed them as the Hawks and the Knicks. I mean, what you're seeing is they don't particularly want you to think of them in terms of regional locations anymore, or city mm-hmm. locations, no matter how valuable those might be as television marketing things. And that's, you know, that's one way the NBA has, has also not hit this kind of, crater that we've seen in, in the NHL and, and baseball. We're with Keith Olbermann. We'll take a quick break and come back with uh, more back after these messages. So McCowan, it's uh, Shannon. Keith Olbermann is uh, joining us today. I, I got an exercise for the three of us. Here's the premise. Hold on. Will I have to break a sweat? I've never seen you do it. I'm not sure it's possible, but... <laughs> um, so we pool all of our uh, feeble resources together and decide to buy a baseball team. And we know that we are not going to be able to match the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Dodgers economically. They're in the $200 million range. We're going to be somewhere between 60 and 75 million, let's say. And so we take a look at four different franchises to try and get a clue of what to do and what not to do. From the what not to do category, the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Baltimore Orioles. From the what to do category, the Tampa Bay Rays and the Oakland A's. What's the difference? What is the difference between two franchises that have demonstrated an inability to make it work and two franchises that mysteriously make it work every year and their budgets are really quite similar. Oberman? Uh, well, I have some, rather than an opinion, I do have a little frontline experience with this. As I said earlier, my friend Stu Sternberg owns the Tampa Bay Rays, the principal owner. And I found this out that, that he was my friend Stu Sternberg one day at Yankee Stadium about 15 years ago, I was loathed by the original owner of the Tampa Bay Rays, Vince Namoli, who, uh, because of a typo uh, on the early Fox Sports website that turned his name into Nairobi, thought I was making fun of him. And I was like, well, no, it was a typo. Plus, how is that funny? And he didn't see. So they used to put my name up on the scoreboard. It's like 700 days since Keith Olbermann has been to the trop to see a game. How dare he criticize us? And, you know, the 900 fans would boo and that would be it. Well, one day I was, I was visiting my friend who was a broadcaster at, in the secure area of Yankee Stadium. And out of nowhere, there appears coming around a corner, a, a, a woman I went to college with who I have not seen since then, but sort of stayed in touch with through the little group of people that you have after you get out of college. And this is now 25 years since we graduated. And she had been a disc jockey at my college radio station. And I had been the sports director and the operations director and around the corner. And she looks at me, I look at her and she goes, you don't remember me, do you? I do. I said, I do, Lisa, of course I remember you. I can't imagine what you're doing here at Yankee Stadium because you hate sports. And the point was she was the girlfriend of my assistant sports director and every once in a while would test their relationship by telling him at 930 when he was supposed to do our 11 o'clock sports cast that it was either the radio station or her 
And so I get this frantic call from my friend, Jim, the assistant sports director. She's doing it again. I can't do the sports cast. I got to, you got to fill in for me. And I would trudge the radio station. and do. That. I don't know how many times that happened, but it had to be more than a dozen. And I said, you hate sports. What are you doing here? And she said, Oh, don't you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Mrs. Stu Sternberg. And I went, well, that's a coincidence because the guy who just bought the, the devil rays here was named Stu Sternberg. And she goes, yes, it's the same one. I went, no. And she said, yes. And at that moment, he came around the corner, looked at me, looked at her and went to her, my God, you're, you weren't joking. You do know him. So the next thing I know, I'm sitting with the new owner of the Tampa Bay Rays, which was easily for long-term lack of success, the worst franchise in baseball since the old St. Louis Browns, maybe the Washington Senators. No the, argument. The Phillies up to 1975 or so. And, and we sat in an in old Yankee stadium and he said, so when am I going to get that salary cap that the owners promised me we were going to get? I went, seriously, they promised you that you were going to get a salary cap? He goes, yeah, that, I mean, they said it might be a couple of years, but what do you think? I mean, you know this. And I went, well, it's not going to happen in this lifetime and probably not the next one. But if you, if you have the team again after your third reincarnation, you might get it. <laughs> and, he, and he looked at me and went, you're serious. And I said, I wouldn't joke about something as fatal as you having bought the, the a major league team thinking there's going to be a salary cap in baseball ever i mean you might have three year long strikes before you have a or lockouts before you have a salary cap i and he said what do i do and i said look at the cleveland indians of the 1990s that's your role model and he went what do you mean i said every time they had a, a player who had clearly elevated from prospect to success uh, at the major league level whether, whether that was a season or 60 games they offered that player an eight-year contract at uh, almost the going rate. And I said, I don't believe any of their players at the age of 23, 24, 22, I don't think any of them turned the money down. And they suddenly had favorable contracts because your expenses are just going to keep going up because salaries are going to keep going up and follow the John Hart Cleveland Indians building thing. It doesn't work forever, but it does. It will give you a 10-year window of stability. I said, and then you have to approach the rest of it as if you're a fantasy league owner buying players in an auction and you're down to your last, you need 10 players and you have $10. Mm -hmm. Who are those $1 players who might become, you know, $25 players? Who are the long shots that other teams have given up on? Look for prospects that other teams have given up on and do the same thing with them. And if they're successful, give them long-term contracts and four years later is in the World Series. So I, that's the that's the role model, and they don't, you know, they did in Pittsburgh. You know, you can list the number of guys that they did not do that with as as young players, and perhaps they made the offers, and and Garrett Cole said no, or the other guys who've been through there said no. But in Tampa, um, most of these guys, they did it with Evan Longoria, they did it with a pitcher named Mike Moore, where it didn't work. They did it with countless other guys, and. You have to be willing to, the ones who aren't going to sign, you have to be willing to trade them for somebody else who might sign. And you have to be willing to spend a dollar understanding you may have to cut that guy and eat that mm -hmm. money and sign somebody else who's even cheaper or just as cheap. And that's the way you, you do it in a market that is not, basically is not uh, not New York or, or Chicago or Los Angeles. And, and the, the variations of that are done by, you know, more successful franchises in larger markets. See, the problem in Pittsburgh is, um beautiful stadium city helped build it uh this is a team with revenue sharing makes a ton of money still what's their incentive to win yeah what's their incentive to spend on players they have none because they are they are a money machine they have a a really loyal fan base that's it's almost it's almost uh, uh almost folklore now that you're a pirates fan yeah. well we're no good yeah but i'm still a pirates fan that's they've created their own aura in their own way. And all they do is put money in their pockets. Well, yes. that speaks to the objective of being an owner um, who wants to make money off his team. And I know all, nobody wants to lose money, but you know, it is sport. And we, we often uh, deride those owners who um, make it clear that they're not as interested in winning as they are in making money. Um, it doesn't explain the Baltimore Orioles totally. And on the other side, it doesn't totally explain the Oakland A's. And maybe the Oakland A's scenario under Billy Bean is different than the Tampa Bay scenario. Um, or at least it was 
you know, a, more than a, a more than a decade ago. I don't know if that's still the case, Keith. Do you think it is? Yeah, I do. There's similarity. I, there, there are some similarities because of the 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 uh, the advantage. The, ironically, the advantage that that you have in Tampa is just to John's point. You are not going to get fifteen to twenty thousand people come out to every Tampa game just to see the stadium. Right. You know, you're getting fifteen. If you get fifteen thousand people to see the trop trop, uh, it's it's against their will to be there. As much as as nice a job as they have done souping it up, it's still it's like the Seattle Kingdom after some sort of you know desperate uh, structural damage. It's just a terrible place, even fixed up. And that's you know the the Oakland Coliseum is to some degree that, but the fans. At least, you know, it's usually the weather is nice and, and they have fun and it's a good environment. And they could sell that and follow a kind of Pittsburgh route and accept the mediocrity that, that gives them a good deal of money. The, the advantage that, that Oakland has is that reputationally, players, particularly second line guys who want to grow, really want to play for Bob Melvin, who's been the manager since 2000. 11 and uh is a friend of mine who i used to sit with at mets games for the one year that he wasn't managing and is just uh, just a is a true teacher and mentor and they've had this advantage since that period of time as the bean influence which was very profound under uh under moneyball in that era began to wane because he could no longer fleece other owners in trades or other yeah. general managers in trades so that's, I mean, I think the Oakland situation is very specific to the personnel. And if something happened where Melvin left, they'd be in serious trouble. But again, you know, the willingness to to move components, the A's, I guess, have, have ob obtained and traded many stars for brief periods of time. And Cespit has played there. John, people forget they then traded John, uh, Cespit for John Lester because they thought he'd be a, a playoff pitcher and could help them win a championship. And then he would walk. You know, there's an there's there's a willingness to say we're we're not going to we're not going to let you walk away with some without some compensation for us. We're going to always be perceived as at least trying to build. And and if you're not you don't want to stay here, we are trading you to somewhere else for something else. And they, you know, Pittsburgh really hasn't been very good at that. They've tried, they've delved in it. And to be fair, in Tampa, uh, the the idea of of developing players and either keeping them by signing them early or trading them for other things was was kind of the name only idea he just he just ran into a series of terrible personnel decisions because you're, you're that's the key thing your margin for error is zero if you want to build a competitive franchise if you want to make money your margin for error is is not zero in Pittsburgh or Oakland or Tampa Bay. There are right. ways around that. But if you want to win, you want to make money by winning, your margin for, for personnel decision errors is zero. And you have to be very good at it. And and mm -hmm. they have been at Tampa. I mean, Tampa Bay is this is the is the now the cradle of of baseball management. The half a dozen teams are run by guys who started there. Oh God, yeah. And it's uh, you know, and that's a I think that's a credit to to my friend Stu, who is a, one of the original uh, uh, money men from Wall Street and has, of course, none of that. I mean, his son is named after Sandy Koufax. What other, what else do you need? We were, we always tried to get him. It was like, we, is there any way we could trade the Mets franchise and just get rid of them and bring Tampa Bay and put them in the, in, in the new stadium and let the Mets move to, to Tampa? It was, uh, I mean, there, there, there is a quality of personnel and commitment that that is part of the equation too and and you know that brings that explains baltimore in which they've had an, a basically an absentee owner who would have been the last person that you would have believed was going to be an absentee owner and he checked out mm -hmm. 25 years ago and nobody's nobody's stepped up i mean everybody's running there without without anybody to make any decisions so that's that explanation i think uh time is our enemy here uh before we let you go uh sons and the bucks get set uh for a um an intriguing NBA final involving two franchises that we have seen very little of in this, at this level of, of play. Um, stars are always the big thing. And the biggest star in this, I think we would all agree is Ante Tocumpo, who may or may not play at any point in this series. There, I think he's doubtful for tonight and probably doubtful for this entire series. That will hurt 
my interest level, it'll hurt the audience. But who do you like in this thing? I, I don't know. I, I will confess to not. Um, I will watch the NBA when paid to. I'm, I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't i mean i they lost me when they legalized traveling I, they really did and i i know that made the sport what it is today and it made it into it was the nba was in the in the high grass in which the nba finals were not shown live on american television during the week they were running i mean the new york knicks winning when i was a kid was not shown live in new york because they didn't think that they thought it might hurt the crowd the gate, yeah. Square Garden. it's just unbelievable in retrospect but I, I do think the, you know, the, the, the NBA always manages to take something like, uh, like his injury and, and turn it into the storyline. Can the Bucks compete without him? And you always trot out you know, every year at this time, Willis Reed's hip and the torn muscles get, get, tor- get brought out, particularly if there's an injury to deal with. They, they'll be fine, but I have no idea of the outcome because frankly, I, couldn't, I, pr- I could not name you the starting lineups of the two teams. And the, the and that's not going to matter. I mean, the ratings will be a little bit less than they would be if it were the the, mm-hmm. the Lakers versus somebody, but it won't be a significant difference because you know NBA fans are geared up to rooting for players and combinations and teams, and it's not it's not like hockey. You no know, people don't run on um, on a on a on a player and stick to that player. And as, as John, as you noted, obviously the, the fundamental thing is you can't have a guy play all but two minutes of a game in the NHL, but it's, you know, there's, there's something, if, if, if that was a roller derby game and the bucks were actually the Lakers wearing different uniforms, people would just would watch anyway and would never know the difference. I mean, there, for all I know, there are only 84 NBA players and they shuffle them around and you know, some of them have mustaches and it's like, wait a minute, this, this woman, Tuffy Brashoon, who played for the, the Bay Area Bombers last week when I was here, what? why is she with the New York Chiefs under the name Buffy Tashoon? What is that all about? You could do that, I think, in the NBA and the, 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 the path that they have made for themselves. So I, I, don't, what, I don't know. And I, I mean, do you, te- you guys tell me. You, you, oh, you, I tell you, you, you're the only guy that would try to put the NBA and roller derby in the same sentence. So good for you. Hey, by the way, so speaking of Willis Reed, uh, you tweeted out uh, something earlier this week about uh, Marv retiring, Marv oh. Albert. Um, what, what was it? What, just before we go, what, what was his influence on you? Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm born in 1959. I became a sports fan in 1967. Marv Albert, that was, I think, the second year he did the Rangers on the radio. And it was magnificent radio hockey play by play. By man. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody since who compared to him in terms of bringing you inside the, the, the game just with the sounds of the game. And he did the Knicks on the radio when very little of either of those teams were on TV. And he hosted the Yankee pregame show on the radio. And in the years to come after that, he began to do the NBA and the NFL on television and did the sports news on the local NBC station at 6 and 11 o'clock. So he'd do a Ranger game, hop in a cab, come up and do the highlights. And he worked all the time. He was everywhere. And that was but that was my primary role model as a kid. And I also believed in my first incarnation, the, the thing I wanted to do first, which was to do the Rangers play-by-play, that I would succeed Marv Albert when he retired. And Marv Albert has just retired, and I'm 62 years old, and I'm not going to replace him. It's, that's how it was like. You know, the, I, I should have watched a little bit more about the the longevity and 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 being able to you know stay at the – absolute pinnacle of your of your business in sports that, that he should have been my role model that way uh, as much as a good play-by-play man but it's a it's a an epic moment I got to work with him several times and and uh, he was always always treated me like an equal when I, it, certainly in my own mind I never came close to that so it's a it's a significant milestone for for a New York sports fan. Uh, well, as we approach, I think, around the 200th episode of uh, this podcast, I believe, Oberman, you, uh, congratulations, you're the first person to uh, raise the subject of roller derby. Yes. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. This is a, this is a huge event. And, and, and I want you to know my favorite team was always the Bay Area Bombers. Bay Area Bombers. Uh, Charlie, what, Charlie O'Connell? Oh, stop. Uh, oh, yeah. No, my, my mother and father, of all the sports that they really enjoy until they decided that 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 the thing was fixed and the players would move around 
<laughs> they went, they had, my mother had a collection of roller derby programs from New York in the 40s and 50s. And she had her favorite, uh, there was a couple that, that married and their son was around. We went to see the son play at Madison Square Garden. And it, you know, it, it certainly outdrew the World Hockey Association today yeah. in the 70s. Oh. Wait, wait, it was fixed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sorry to disappoint you all. You will have to... I see all those roller derby, the the, the big uh, the big roller derby cup behind you on That's the right. uh, screen <laughs> that they gave to the winner, and then the then of course they console the loser, and you you're watching the interviews, and it's the same guy, yeah. He's the winning and losing teams, and yes, it was like it was slightly <laughs> slightly we, we use the term I think prearranged now, uh, yeah, Scripted. it was entertainment, roller derby, wrestling, and high yeah. There you go, oh, high and Bridgeport. Oh, the Highline and Bridgeport. Oh, my goodness. Three. Well, we'll have a conversation about that somewhere down the road. Mr. Oberman, it's always our pleasure. We thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll, we'll bug you fixed. somewhere down the road, I hope. All right. You know, I, we can, if you're in here, we can go to that restaurant that I mentioned. Yeah. Butternut well, squash ravioli. Choice. Oh, that's, oh, my God. I'm not, I may go down there and see if it'll open early. <laughs> <laughs> a little pasta for Keith, please. Uh, thank you. We'll talk again soon. And my John pleasure. and I will be back after this. Well, yeah, and our thanks to uh, Keith Oberman. for. I'm uh, hungry now. Once again. I'm hungry. Oh, you want to go to the restaurant? You want to go to McDonald's? You want to go to McDonald's? Well, no, I was, I was trying just to prove a point that not everybody can do the high-end stuff every day. You know, the golden arches of Shannon Steakhouses are still very, very prevalent. Well, know? but it's a pasta joint. I'm sure it's not all that expensive. And, you know, if it's you'd New work, York, Bob, if, Bob, if you'd, it's if you'd, New York City. Yes, but if you'd worked harder during your career, you'd have enough money. You wouldn't have to go to McDonald's. You'd be able to go and, and have a steak every night. Well, you know, I, I, I actually like McDonald's. You're not telling me anything I don't know. I mean, and it, it, could, I be get on, it. it could be on DoorDash anytime, you know? Congratulations. <laughs> have you had the, uh, the Grand Big Mac yet? No, no. I just read about it. Is that it. what it's called? I don't know. I, I, I don't I, even know. I see the I see the ad on TV. It looks about this. Oh. It looks the same as a Big Mac. Has yeah. it got two quarter pounders in it? Is that what the idea is? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, when you try one, you'll report back. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's my first assignment. Uh, that'll do it for us. Uh, another episode uh, coming your way tomorrow. Come back if the crick don't rise. Uh, for Shannon McCowan. Goodbye, everybody. Mm -hmm.